The World Health Organization definition of stroke is rapidly developing clinical signs of focal or global disturbance of cerebral function, with symptoms lasting 24 hours or longer or leading to death with no apparent cause other than of vascular origin. This means that patients with similar symptoms caused by other causes such as tumours, subdural hematomas, poisoning or trauma are not considered strokes. The difference between a stroke and a TIA or a transient ischemic attack is that a TIA is a brief episode of neurological dysfunction, typically less than one hour but up to 24 hours, with a vascular cause and with no evidence of infarction, meaning cell death, on imaging. They were previously distinguished by the duration of the neurological symptoms, but now are distinguished based on the absence of infarct evidence on imaging and resolution of symptoms. The two main types of stroke are ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke, with around 80% being ischemic. An ischemic stroke is caused by the blockage of blood flow, while a hemorrhagic stroke is caused by a rupture and extravasation of blood in the brain or surrounding tissue. Also note that strokes with ischemic areas have a risk for bleeding, therefore ischemic stroke can undergo what is known as a hemorrhagic transformation. There are four main mechanisms for an ischemic stroke. The first is thrombosis, which is divided into large and small vessel disease. Large vessel disease involves the common and internal carotids, the vertebral arteries and the circle of Willis. The main causes of thrombi here include atherosclerosis, vasoconstriction, dissection and vasculitis. Small vessel disease involves smaller branches of the circle of Willis and arteries in the distal vertebral and basilar arteries. Causes here include lipohyalinosis, which is a buildup of fatty hyaline matter secondary to hypertension and aging, as well as microatheromas, which are small atherosclerotic plaques. Thrombi can also be caused by sickle cell red blood cells clumping together, and thrombi may also generate emboli, which are the second mechanism for ischemic stroke. Emboli are entities that travel in the blood and can be part of a thrombus that has then broken off. They can be fat, they can be air, or even cancer, or clumps of bacteria. Most commonly, the source of the embolus is the heart, due to atrial fibrillation, atrial or ventricular thrombi, rheumatic heart disease, recent myocardial infarction, or even recent coronary artery bypass grafting. Emboli may also travel from sources such as a deep vein thrombosis, and if the patient has a shunt present, such as an arterial or ventricular septal defect, then this venous embolus can move into the arterial circulation and potentially generate a stroke. Ultimately, around 30-40% to 40 of ischemic strokes are deemed cryptogenic meaning no clear cause was found. And a subtype of these cryptogenic strokes are embolic strokes of undetermined source, which is estimated to be around 1 in 6 or 15% of all ischemic strokes. Next, we have cerebral or systemic hypoperfusion, which is a global reduction in blood flow to the brain. This is most commonly caused by a reduction in cardiac output, either through cardiac arrest or arrhythmias, or even myocardial infarction or pulmonary embolism. It can also occur secondary to other forms of shock. Areas of brain supplied by the distalmost branches of the main cerebral arteries are most at risk, as the flow to these points is the first to diminish. These are known as watershed areas. Cerebral venous thrombosis can cause ischemic stroke by causing the venous pressure to rise beyond that of the arterial pressure. This prevents blood flow. These strokes have a higher probability of hemorrhagic transformation and typically present with a worsening headache over a period of weeks. Patients often have a risk factor present, such as thrombophilia or maybe postpartum. The signs and symptoms and their severity will vary based on the region of the brain involved, as well as the size of the affected region and for how long it is ischemic. The Bamford or Oxford classification classifies stroke based on the clinical findings and will give you an idea of the brain territory affected. Generally, the anterior circulation is provided by the internal carotid arteries and their branches, while the posterior circulation arises mostly from the vertebral arteries. 
To make this easier to remember, I'll include the circle of Willis here as a refresher, because this is where the anterior and posterior circulation meet. From the internal carotids, the main two arteries are the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery, shown here. The vertebral arteries join and form the basilar artery, from which comes the posterior cerebral artery, shown here. The first of the Bamford classification is a total anterior circulation syndrome, which affects the entire anterior circulation supplying one side of the brain. In most cases, this involves the proximal middle cerebral artery. This is considered when the patient displays all three of the following deficits. Unilateral motor and or sensory deficits involving at least two out of the face, the arm or the leg, higher dysfunction such as dysphasia, visual or spatial disturbances, or a decreased level of consciousness, and then we have homonymous hemianopia. Partial anterior circulation syndrome is a less severe form of the total anterior circulation syndrome, where only part of the anterior circulation has been compromised on the affected side. For this category, two out of three of the above mentioned symptoms are needed, or the patient needs to have a partial motor or sensory dysfunction, typically affecting one limb, or higher dysfunction alone. Next, we have the posterior circulation syndrome, which can also affect the cerebellum and the brainstem, and therefore they often have cerebellar signs such as ataxia and nystagmus. Other features include ipsilateral cranial nerve and contralateral motor or sensory defects, bilateral motor or sensory defects alone, or an isolated homonymous hemianopia. The fourth class is a lacuna stroke syndrome, where lacuna strokes are small subcortical infarctions that are usually smaller than 1.5 to 2 centimeters. These occur due to occlusion of the smaller penetrating arteries that provide blood flow to the deeper brain structures. There are different subtypes depending on the structure involved, which includes pure motor stroke, pure sensory stroke, ataxic hemiparesis that presents with cerebellar signs, dysarthria or clumsy hand syndrome, which presents with slurred speech and difficulty with fine motor movements, particularly of the hand. Mixed sensory motor is another, presenting with hemiparesis and sensory impairment, but no aphasia, no visual field deficits, neglect, or other symptoms. The diagnosis, as we mentioned, is a clinical diagnosis, with imaging supporting this diagnosis. Patients will typically undergo a CT head without contrast as soon as is possible, and the scan is done without contrast because we are looking to rule out the presence of acutely coagulated blood, which would appear white, rather than looking for specific ischemic changes. This is for two reasons. If we see the presence of blood, then of course thrombolysis or antiplatelet therapy would not be given, as it would exacerbate the bleed. The second reason is because a bleed can be visualized sooner on the CT scan, whereas an area of infarct may take many hours to become visible. Further imaging may include a CT angiography or carotid ultrasound, looking for areas of stenosis or anatomical defects, and may be part of the workup if thrombectomy is being considered. MRI is used in some instances where perhaps the cause or presentation is unclear as it provides better resolution imaging and may reveal lesions missed on the CT. Following the CT head, if the patient is suspected to have an acute ischemic event and the onset of the symptoms is within four hours, they may be considered for thrombolysis with agents such as recombinant tissue plasminogen activator or alteplase. If the time of onset is not clear, then the last time the person was seen well is taken to be the onset time. A thrombectomy, which is the mechanical removal of a clot via surgery, may be considered in some instances. The patient will then be moved to an acute stroke unit where they will require an assessment of their swallowing and will be placed on cardiac monitoring to look for underlying cause of stroke, such as atrial fibrillation. Typically, aspirin 300 mg will be started for roughly two weeks, alongside a proton pump inhibitor, especially if the patient has a history of dyspepsia, or clopidogrel 300 mg may be started if there is an allergy to aspirin. Patients who have atrial fibrillation or another indication for anticoagulation will usually have their anticoagulation 
held for the first two weeks and will be restarted as part of secondary prevention. But there are now trials looking at the benefits of starting the anticoagulation earlier. Another crucial aspect to stroke management is rehabilitation, which can involve speech and language therapy, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, as well as sometimes psychiatric involvement. Following the acute phase, we look at secondary prevention. We have already mentioned antiplatelet agents like aspirin or clopidogrel, but other measures are also taken, including balancing lipid levels with statins, such as atorvastatin, blood pressure control, typically with ACE inhibitors being the first line, such as ramipril, or alternatives are calcium channel blockers, such as amlodipine, or diuretic, such as indapamide. Diabetes or hyperglycemia will also need to be controlled, as well as other modifiable risk factors, such as cessation of smoking and reducing alcohol intake. Anticoagulation can be used in some patients, such as atrial fibrillation or recurrent pulmonary embolism.